In this class, we look at the sources of information that inform us about the archaeology of stuff. The most obvious source of information is excavation. For instance, this is claimed to be the earliest known campfire found in excavation. This is me in Syria in 2002 excavating. I'm, I'm on the right. It was a long time ago, 2002. Um, excavation has a long history. People have episodically dug holes to find ancient stuff for thousands of years, but has had a consistent development since the late 18th century. But even here you can see they knew that they were digging, they knew where they were digging, so that their knowledge must have started before they actually started digging. As even excavation is dependent on other forms of archaeological fieldwork. For example, aerial photography has made a contribution. And now we can even do fieldwork from space. Now this little pimple here, this strange volcano-like thing, is actually a prehistoric structure, one of a number I found while field walking across the Syrian desert with my team from the monastery of Dir Musa. Of course, from excavations you get stuff, sometimes very nice stuff. You also get objects with which other stuff was made, providing further understanding of the production sequence. Another source of data is depiction of stuff in artwork. This again includes depiction of the sequence of production, like these Neo-Assyrians returning with a raw material acquisition expedition, in this case wood. This wall painting of Egyptians making beads and jewellery depicts the manufacturing process. As does this Egyptian who is making pottery on a slow wheel. These Egyptians are making... working with wood, with axes and chisels. Objects are also depicted which do not otherwise exist in the archaeological record. For example, this depiction of a Neo-Assyrian king shows him reclining on wooden furniture that has long since rotted away. In this detail, you can see some of the things that might have survived. This very heavy string of barrel-shaped beads are probably made of agate from India. This figure on the leg may actually be carved of ivory. A room filled with these panels was found at Nimrud, another Neo-Syrian palace, all that was left of a store of furniture. <clears throat> Although this is the archaeology of stuff, not the history of stuff, texts are very useful. An example is Agricola's De Re Metallica of 1556, which has text and images of metal prospecting, Acquisition, processing, and manufacturing. There are also, of course, texts from the Middle East. There are also texts that show you how objects are used. For instance, this is showing you how to hit someone with a sword. The next type of data is from the study of contemporary craftspeople and artists and also how objects are used by contemporary people. This is sometimes called ethnography. Some of these are actually old studies done before the impact of modernism. Others may be done by people studying the archaeology of stuff directly. For example, this photogra photograph of a potter in Iran was taken by me. A source of information that we use regularly, regularly in these lectures is the traditional crafts of Persia by Hans Wolf. It has useful diagrams of equipment used and photographs of the production sequence. 
analysis of the objects, objects themselves is another source of information. This may be as simple as looking at an object with an informed eye or with low power magnification. This is me in 1995 in Iran, by the way. An extension to just looking at objects is looking at how use of the object has impacted it. For example, shells like this from a prehistoric site in Israel have naturally occurring holes in them. High magnification examination of the holes shows that they have been abraded by having a cord strung through them, while other wear shows that they were arranged side by side. At about 200,000 years ago, this is the earliest evidence of cords or uh, string and possibly the earliest evidence for adornment in the world. Another form of analysis is the whole field of archaeometry, the application of sciences to determine things about stuff. This includes geoarchaeology. For example, this geological sequence of an archaeological site in Egypt published in 1858 show that some of the sites clearly predate, predate the then widely agreed age of the Earth. There are aspects of physical anthropology, including the study of bones and physical traces of what has happened to the remains of the people of the past that show the effect on humans. For example, regular use of high-powered bows has been shown to leave evidence in the development of the attachments of arm muscles. And of course, human remains can show the direct effect of objects on their body, such as this individual that had an arrow shot through his head. Zoo archaeology studies animals in archaeology. For example, these horses from a chariot burial. Why it is archaeobotany rather than botanical archaeology, I don't know, but this is the widely used term for the study of plants including wood, in archaeology. DNA has made a tremendous impact on archaeology in the past few years. Objects are sometimes related to groups of people. Sometimes it was thought they were in the past, but it has been shown that the objects and technology moved around, but the people didn't. Looking at people's DNA might help us determine that. One type of object that enabled the spread of people is boats. When I was an undergraduate, it was thought that the spread of people along the southern coast of Asia was due to them walking. Coming from a port city myself, I always thought it was boats. Of course, we always knew that boats must have been used to get to Australia, but somehow the people of the peopling of the Americas was entirely through a narrow temporary passage through the ice sheets. Now we think people were in the Americas much earlier and probably came by boats along the coast. There are also a host of archaeological sciences that rely on understanding the molecular nature of the universe, which is why I will talk about it for a bit in a future lecture. Going quickly down the list, there are techniques to examine the residues left in ancient pottery, a number of ways of using isotopes to get an idea of where people came from and moved to. Radiocarbon itself is a very useful isotope used in dating in archaeology. Luminescence dating is based on crystals trapping photons. And then there are all the techniques of analysing objects themselves to determine the minerals and elements that the object is made of. I will mention two techniques. I'll also bring it to your attention. There are no green arrows on this sheet. On this slide, one should I say. One te technique I have used is the application of a scanning electron microscope, or SEM, with an attached X-ray spectrometer. This requires taking a sample and inserting it into the SEM under a vacuum. Here the sample, in this case a piece of pottery, is bombarded with X-rays. Reflected X-rays can be collected to create an image. In this image, degree of intensity of reflectance is created by the density of the elements in the material being studied. A focused beam of electrons can be used to analyse a microscopic part of the sample. X-rays emitted from the sample are characteristic of the elements analysed, and so you can determine the chemistry of the object. An important technique I use 
to determine where pottery is made is called petrographic analysis. This is a geological technique developed to identify minerals and examine them in high magnification. In this we take a piece of pottery, grind one side until it's optically flat and glue this to a glass slide. This is ground down on special grinders until it is 0.03 millimeters thick. This is a thin section. We then put this into a special polarized light microscope. Light is transmitted through the sample. However, the light is polarized. Ordinary, ordinary light vibrates in all directions, but polarized light only vibrates along a single plane. Another polarized filter at right angles blocks all light, except that which is refracted by minerals. Refraction is well known as the effect of light on the prism. All crystals, all crystalline minerals have this effect on light. Only the actual range of the spectrum is dictated by the structure and chemistry of the mineral. Here in this thin section of pottery from the Yemen, a mineral called biotite and other inclusions of quartz, felspars and volcanic rock. Here the same thin section is in cross-polarized light, showing the refraction caused by the minerals. The quartz with a low refractive index, as we call it, is grey, while the biotite with a high refractive index is more colourful. I actually teach an entire course on this technique, which you might consider taking if you want to study archaeology at graduate levels, especially if it involves pottery. The next area of information is experimental archaeology, sometimes called ethnoarchaeology. In this approach, practitioners attempt to make the objects of the past and see how they work, and also experiment with them to try to reproduce breaks in use wear found on the archaeology, archaeological objects. For example, the study uh, back here, the example, this is a part of a study to example breaks from high impact collisions with deer carcasses, carcasses is dead deer, enabling the identification of types of arrowhead that do not look like the widespread perception of what an arrowhead looks like. This vessel on the left is medieval, but the one on the right is a reproduction. Reproductions were blown up on Scarborough Beach with gunpowder to see if their breakage pattern reflected those found in the original, and they did, rather supporting the idea that these are actually medieval hand grenades. So once you have all of this data, you need to think. Thoughts are often influenced by perceptions that create bias. Many people use inappropriate language for the technology of the people of the past, although it was easy. It really isn't, as you will find out if you ever try to throw a pot or shoot a bow. Instead, think on this technology as being positive things. Many technologies of the past were highly sustainable, lasting thousands of years. We don't know if our civilization will survive decades, so it's best not to look down on civilizations which have lasted tens of thousands of years. Archaeological preservation greatly influences perception. For example, if I asked you who the person on the left was, you would have a pretty good idea, but the person on the right might be tricky. Tutankhamun ruled Egypt briefly and accomplished little, it seems, but we know his face and his name. Naram Sin expanded the great empire of Akkad and was a significant figure in history, but gold is an unusually influential material, which in the Middle East was almost entirely found in Egypt. Archaeologists themselves have been greatly biased by the materials they study. For lithics and ceramics, the most abundant artefact types sometimes seem to be the only artefact type to the people studying them, but the bulk of the objects made by the people of the past have either decayed or been melted down. Recycling is not a new concept, but was the norm until recent times. Another perception is gender. It was once thought that the term man meant all of humanity, although it wasn't really. Really, the establishment thought men did everything and made everything, despite evidence to the contrary. 
Even though feminism started decades ago, it's only recently that it seems professionals have been open to being less binary about creativity. Medical analysis of the hands of these paintings show that a significant, significant number of them were female. Women are found in significant roles like this shaman, a type of spiritual leader. This individual created a controversy quite recently. DNA evidence indicated that this Viking Age warrior's grave from Sweden, filled with weapons, was that of a woman. This created a furor, and indeed there were problems with the study. For example, graves are created by the living who deposit the dead with whatever the living think is relevant. But if this was a male, no one would entertain the idea that this was a warrior's grave, and many individuals exhibited biases that were not substantiated. Many scholars actually found other evidence that Viking women went into battle. More recently, we heard that this Bronze Age jeweller, found with the tools of the trade, was a woman. This, however, goes both ways. This important study, a woman's work, talked about the textile industry, an often neglected area of study, perhaps partly due to lack of preservation of textiles, but perhaps also because it was thought this was one area where women did most of the work. But here's a man working in the textile industry. So the best thing is probably not to believe everything you read or hear, and certainly don't trust your perceptions. So next week we shall be starting to look at why does the Middle East and the world look quite like this? <laughs>